Scientific studies have a bias You got your facts, I got weight But why if, maybe a little crazy Studying language AZ and everything between English colonized lies, I won't settle for your dreams Shuttle on the scene, I'm flying, I'm unidentified Trying to give me titles, I flip the script like a Gemini Align with the stars, yes, really I am A stronger being than Iron Man Never mind the world, I got the iron hand Never mind the money, you should see my palm I could touch the world, atomic bomb style You know life goes on, child We've only been here for a long while Starving and I'm walking down a long aisle Everybody looking at me like I'm on trial Oh, cause my skin tone sound like wow Sound like wow It just sound like wow Sound like wow. Wisdom of the womb in your ear right now. Now, it just sound like. Call my chest, the symbol of my success I travel through time and mind, give this body a rest I'll shoddy the sheriff, no need to body the rest Shells alter his chest, I'm just revolving the stress Since we all plagued, I drop pearls of age No equivalent wage, words stick to the pages Of the sages, written for some everyday kids We grow old, you know they say we don't stay big Tables turn, what's your response to how they live? It's getting late, we running out of time Why well, I call it mankind if anybody gets left behind? Shout out to my mother, she's a great gift for fun. All this greatness in line, sacred paradigm spinning in my mind. And it just sound like wow. It just sound like wow. Sound like wow. It just sound like wow. Walk 20 some grams from my sock All I ask is please listen when I talk I just hope to shift the coast when I drop All I know is that the limit isn't my stop On this road, how much collisions will I cops? Always on the mind, and if you're holding it down, pop It can't hurt to ask right The better man is never supposed to play the ass right I could be the worst, I was pondering it last night Buy a palm through an owl in a tree A bit about me, not sure about what you see I'm a real mother's son, not sure about what you be Whatever will, I guess On my worst day, I may reveal my best So you can sell your soul, I will still invest To uplift the rest who are still oppressed yes. Sound like wow It just sound like wow Sound like wow. Wisdom of the womb in your ear right now. chapters of White Cargo. As you know, um, our beloved sister, uh, Sister Anna Eve, um, unfortunately, ha- unfortunately had a fire in her home. You know, things happen in three. She lost her mother, she lost her father, and the fire. But she's fine. She's going to be fine. If you want to give love to her, then it's <laughs> excuse me, through greeting or, or you know, we're not saying finances, but if that's what you want to do, whatever you want to do. Um, hold on one second. Excuse me. You can do that by sending it to the same place you send the proclamation um, paperwork, that mailing, which is 1401 Western Street, number 1145, Hartford, 
Connecticut, 06143. That's 141 Western Street, number 1145, Hartford, Connecticut. Now, let me just say this to you. Hold on one second. You know, you know the saying about the broadcast must go on. You know, people say the show must go on. But for us, it's the broadcast must go on. Because, as I said, Annie E. is not veiled. I'm here, but I caught a little cold. Now, as Annie E. will tell us all, I didn't really catch a cold. You know, people say they caught a cold. But what they actually did <clears throat> was um, consume something uh, by eating the wrong thing that causes the uh, mucus in your body, and the mucus in your body then becomes a playground for other bacteria and germs and things as such. So we must watch what we eat. And, yes, I did slip off. I love bread. I shouldn't. I ought not have done it, but I did. And so you couple that with whatever uh, things you do in life, your normal stresses or what have you, and it's a bit of, it can be a disaster. So I am here, and I just want to, um, I got to thank um, Sister Tayeta for coming over and, and making an, a beautiful cup of echinacea tea with ginger in it, because I'm telling Sister, I need, I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling well. I don't have energy. I, I think I, I sound like I have a cold. Will it be all right? And of course, she knowing me for years and years, she says, you sound the same as you always sound, <laughs> you know, and I realized, you're right, we, we're going to do this thing. So I'm feeling very good about it um, because it is the last two chapters. Now, the only thing for me is I just thought it's only right just that Sister Anna E would read these last two chapters because, you know, this was her choice of book. In fact, this whole circle of readers, what we now are naming it, uh, Eyes Wide Open Circle of Readers, is, is, an, uh, is, an, is a thought that she had. And, you know, this is the first book that has been read. She did read a chapter or two from another book. I can't remember what it was, but it was one of those many books now that tell the truth about who is who and what is what in terms of the most unbelievable thing that you could probably have imagined or at least your family and the family before you could have imagined was that modern Europeans, what you call white people, you know, white people, modern Europeans are the original slaves in this land, on this land. The plantations were established for them, brought over by the British or the brutish Moors to work in companies. Now, come on, that is a lot. And if you find yourself not able to disseminate that information, first of all, you have to study it. This is what study is. You have to read, you have to get specific, you have to imagine where we are with that knowledge, you know, and I think about all of the people who call themselves black, you know, look what the, you know, look what the quote unquote white man has done, you know, we are slaves and we are the slaves and all of this and all, of, you know, I, I imagine this is why Prophet Noble Journey brought the information, which he said you must study to get the other half of it. Imagine what they must be thinking and feeling if they are. To know, and you too, and all of us who have been affected by that farce, by that half truth, so by that truth and falsehood being strangely mixed, you know, to the point where it's just a blatant, all out lie, right, that you grew up on, more that you grew up with, that you thought that your thing was to fight quote unquote racism because you're the slave who has to pull yourself up by the bootstrap and all that, that's delusion because it's not the truth. Now, we're not saying that we weren't enslaved. We're not saying that they didn't hang people on the straight, you know, strange fruit, as Billie Holiday said when she was traveling through the South. She saw strange fruit and she made a song out of it. And, you know, uh, many other people who have witnessed that, we're not saying none of that did not happen, all right? But I'm saying, can you imagine that you're thinking that there's no contribution to you, to society, to the world, because, you know, you were just, what, peeled off a wall and, 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 and was a slave? No, you're the descendant, lineal descendant of the mothers and fathers of civilization and civilization principles. 
And yes, there's a fall of humanity. Horrible things happen at the hands of really Moors, brutish Moors. Now, that's the truth to know and to then fix. See, you can't fix it, something if you don't know what the problem is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so what we end up with is another statement because of mental enslavement and lies and the mental uh, misguidance end up with the saying that says the problem is, the problem is what you perceive the problem is. That's crazy, right? But because man is mine, that's true because it's a matter of the problem is what you really think the problem is. It's how you, what you perceive it. The problem is how you perceive the problem. So if you're perceiving this situation in a false manner that is not true, you know, and this goes to all those people who say, well, what is truth? What is truth? What is truth? Your truth is not my truth. Well, probably not dealing with perception. But truth doesn't change, nor does it pass away. So that's the truth we're talking about. How you handle it, how you deal with it, you know, is your, is a different story. And therefore, your perception of it is different. We have a whole nation of family of people who call themselves Negro, call it black, whatever, you know, every 20 years, something different, who literally are operating from a mental enslaved position because they believe or because they don't know the truth. And then with that truth, do what you will with it. But to march through for generations without knowing the truth, you know, and that's why for some of you who read some ancient scriptures, um, it says many will die without knowing. That's real talk. That's real. So what that means is that the problem is never solved because I can guarantee you one thing for sure. If there is a problem, and you, you know, we, some people say positively, you know, there are no problems, just solutions. But I can tell you this, if, it, if the problem is there and you don't know what it is, you can't break it down to its components to know what it is, you're never, ever, ever going to solve it. It can't happen. It just won't happen. It doesn't work that way. So our effort here is to give the truth and um, also to um, present for the next generation and the generations present and future coming and near coming or near future or really because the present actually determines the future. So the, 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 the past just happened a second ago, you know what I mean? So what you do now determines tomorrow or the next minute or what have you. So by providing and finding and sharing and knowing documented <laughs> records and things like that of the truth, you know, it can prepare us for curriculum uh, for to teach our children that's coming. You know, it really is necessary. Otherwise, you'll have uh, some other um, agenda, people with other agendas to keep you suppressed, creating the curriculum every, you know, school year or what have you which is exactly what's happening, and that's why it's become so very, very dumbed down in terms of the quote-unquote public school education system, you know, uh, uh, because they, they're those who are at the helm of that have a different um, agenda always had. It's called social engineering, quite frankly, um, and the public schools do not have an obligation to you. I know you think they do, but guess what? Guess what? They don't because you got to know who they are, so. You and I have an obligation to ourselves. And so that's what this hopefully will do is, is to be able to lay down information to be a curriculum. Now, that means that first we have to go through, it's just like when you have a death in your family. The first thing you have is the shock. Then you experience the anger. Regardless of whether you're angry at the person who died, angry at the person that you think caused the death, whatever the anger is, and then it's acceptance. So right now, this is just, you know, uh, bringing in the information. It, is, it, it, is, it has to happen that the emotions are taken out in order to properly prevent 
a curriculum or or a body of information or what ha- or what have you desired the, the the ultimate desire is that you who are listening teach your children who will not have any bias because they're only going to take in what you tell them. All right? That you, that we, all of us, teach our children and grandchildren, et cetera, the truth, you know, so that they won't have any emotions about it that they feel uh, 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 deceived or, you know, uh, fraud, uh, fraud being placed upon them. They're never going to feel that because you, I'm going to tell them the truth. We are going to have curriculum to tell our children the truth and and go from there. It's That's it. So we're at a cleansing of emotion period. And this is why you have so many people getting caught up in so many things because part of it is that they're coming out of this mental slavery unprepared, absolutely unprepared. The only thing they have is the desire to quote unquote, I'll say be free because we're all born free, really. But they have this desire to express their liberty, you know, their liberty. And so they have that. They know they have that. Then they have the emotions about, you know, uh, uh, you know, finding the truth. And you mix the two, and it's volatile. So there has to be a cleansing period. And that's what's happening now. And then it's predicated often and has been prophesied to be predicated by a rebellion. <laughs> and that's what we're definitely seeing now is the rebellion on all levels. So keep a level head. Teach your, give your children the maximum, the maximum of truth so that they can have a level head. How about that? And don't, and, and sidestep, you know, the resistance and the rebellion that you spend your time indoors studying might be a good idea. What do you think? So with that being said, we are going to um, we are going to begin the reading, and I trust that um, our avid readers are listening and, and, and those who get involved, they know who they are, uh, Asim and Bakari, um, because, uh, again, this is the last two chapters, so we're going to make these last two chapters great for for um, for the ending of this particular book for our sister Anna Eden in honor of her entire idea. I know she has another book that's going to come next, but I'm not sure what that is, so I'll let her do the honors of mentioning that when we hear from her. All right? So with that being said, the last chapter is, I mean, the next to the last chapter, because it's up there is only two. It's chapter 18, which is a nine, by the way, for you numerologists, means completion. This is called, how about this, it's entitled, His Majesty's Seven-Year Passengers. Wow. Now, hold on a moment, I guess. Just got to, I really got to just take a sip of this wonderful ginger and echinacea tea that they have made for me. Thank you again, sister. She's on the way, but she came over to do that, so she, thank you. All right. His Majesty's Seven-Year Passengers. <clears throat> on, this, on 23rd December, 1769, the Virginia Gazette carried extracts of a letter from a gentleman in Boston to a friend in London. Heavy with irony, it made a point about slavery. All the provinces, the common cry is liberty and independence. Virginia and Maryland, with some reason, form a pretentious, a pretension to independency. The bulk of the inhabitants or their progenitors forfeited their rights as subjects in England and were banished to America to expiate the crime they had committed in Europe. They suffered after their immigration for seven, 14 years or their life. One of the two. Oh, hold on, everyone. I know we just started the paragraph, but I just got a note from Sister Anna E. who I obviously, of course, is listening, and she said the next book, it's going to be They Were White and They Were Slaves. All right. Woo. They 
were white and they were slaves. Now, let me just say this. That's great because that's a heck of a type. They were white and they were slaves. This one says white cargo. So this book right here has prepared you should. Ought to have prepared you for the foundation necessary to accept <laughs> the next book. They were white and they were slaves. And not the slaves. And I know it's going to get, uh, 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 you know, a, a lot more detail or more information. I won't say detail because slavery is slavery and that's that. All right. And, and, you know, before I start, I just wanted to, this sentence, and I know we read through, but I'm glad that I uh, did take a, a, a hesitation here because it says that they're, they're, they were banished to America, crime they had committed in Europe. So remember when you may have heard that, um, you know, these modern Europeans came here and they were from the, 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 the jails and they were slave, and they were uh, uh, murderers and rapists and criminals. Well, there it is right there. So let's pick up from there. So uh, they were banished to America to expiate the crime they had committed in Europe. They suffered after their immigration for seven, 14 years, or either for their life. But they should not forget that they came over as slaves, that there are many daily arriving in that capacity, and that two-thirds of the inhabitants, white or black, are now actually slaves. The observations were distorted, but as America approached the parting of the ways with England, Many exiled whites from Britain were indeed arriving daily and being thrust into slavery. They were His Majesty's seven-year passengers, convicts, sentenced to seven or 14 years of sometimes life transportation to His Majesty's American plantation. For much of the previous century, convicts had been shipped over spasmodically in relatively modest numbers and sold as servants. Now they poured into New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston to be marketed. In the final decade of British rule, at least 900 a year were arriving and possibly even more. The convict trade was big business. The merchants who transported most of them in the early 1770s claimed that it was twice as profitable as the year 1718 marked the start of the mass emptying of England's gals into America on the scale first envisioned more than a century earlier. The trigger was the ending of the War of the Spanish Succession in 1714. This unleashed thousands of unemployed soldiers on a country already suffering a crime wave, and prisons began to overflow. It might have been expected that convict transportation would be used immediately to ease the situation, but there was increasing resistance in the colonies to the admission of convicts and merchants to the admission of convicts, and merchants were reluctant to take them because few fetched a good enough price on the American servant market. As a result, the number of transported villains dwindled. In the years immediately after the war ended, judges at London's Old Bailey sentenced no one to transportation. An act of parliament passed in 1717 transformed the situation. It was entitled An Act for the Further Preventing robbery, burglary, and other felonies, and for the more effectual transportation of felons and unlawful exporters of wool, and for declaring the law upon some points relating to pirates. Despite the references to pirates and wool, this measure was all about convict transportation. When it passed into law, preamble stated that it had two prime objectives, to deter criminals and supply the colonies with servile labor. To act, the act overrode colonial restrictions on the convict trade, empowered judges to make far greater use of transportation, <laughs> and turned the business of shipping convicts to America 
into a gold mine for the merchants contracted to do it. They were to be officially endowed with property rights in the men and women who were turned over to them from the gals and to get a subsidy for every convict landed in America. The subsidy up to five ahead meant that whatever price the convict fetched, the merchant couldn't lose. A slave trader secured the most lucrative contract for convicts from London and the home county. He was one of the merchants operating, excuse me, uh, excuse me, hold on. Okay. He was one of <clears throat> one of the merchants operated. This is uh, Jonathan Forward. Okay, uh, secured the most lucrative contract for convicts from London and the home county. He was one of the merchants operating on the notorious triangular route, taking English manufacturers to West Africa, where he acquired shitloads of slaves, whom he then shipped to the New World, where he was paid where he was paid for his human cargo in sugar or in tobacco. On the last leg, he shipped these commodities home. Forward offered to take convicts for a subsidy of $3 a head, <laughs> which undercut the opposition substantially. I believe that's three lyrics. That's where there's an L in it, but I'm going to say that won him the contract, but it was a law leader. Soon after the first shipment of English villainy, Forward secured a huge increase in the subsidy to $5 per convict. The sentencing formula had been devised in Ireland and had been in, in operation there for some 15 years. Under an act passed by the Irish Parliament in 1703, courts were authorized to commute the minor offenses to a sentence of transportation for seven or 14 years, or sometimes life. Those guilty of stealing one cow, but not two, qualified as well as those guilty of stealing nine, but not ten. Sheep and those who had stolen other property, uh, 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 qualified well as those guilty of stealing nine, but not ten sheep. And those who had stolen other property worth less than 20 shillings, that act would be used to send countless thousands from Ireland and England. The value of any property stolen would similarly determine who was executed and who transported under the new act. Here, too. The sentences available were seven or 14 years or life. On 23rd of April, 1718, the first felons judged under the new act heard their fate pronounced in Justice Hall at the Old Bailey. They consisted of 15 women and 13 men, all guilty of minor property crimes, to have been the small fry of the English underworld, or to be in the dock because of one of those mad, bitterly regretted lapses that mark people criminal forever. They included a tavern skivvy condemned for taking on some plates of leftover food, a couple of young shoplifters, a man who had stolen a coach cushion, and a drunk who seems to have gone off with the tankers he had sucked from. For these crimes, they were each to be sold in America. The heaviest villain amongst them was a lone burglar. The contract bound the merchants to ship to America every one sentenced to transportation, using any by reason of age, lameness, or any other infirmities whatsoever. Once the felon was in America, it was left to the merchant to decide how to dispose of him or her. Rich felons could pay the merchant off and become free men or women as long as they didn't return to England. 
the rest, the vast majority, were sold off as servants for whatever the merchant could get. For the convicts, the journey began as it ended in chains. The merchant contractor would have paid for the first group of 20, eight transports to have been ironed and lodged in Newgate, probably, let me read that over. The merchant contractor would have paid for the first group of 28 transports to have been ironed and lodged in Newgate, probably in a huge cell beneath ground level. When the contractor's ship was ready, the transporters faced a half-mile tramp to the river amid the jeers of Londoners, who always collected at the sight of manacled men and women. Forward used the eagle, a vessel that he diverted from the African slave run. He described her as most suitable for convicts. On board, the convicts were held between decks, chained together in messes of six. From the outset, convict ships were beset by mutants. In 1718, 30 prisoners took over a ship bound for the plantation and got ashore in France. In 1735, 40 Irish convicts ran their vessel aground off of Nova Scotia, murdered the entire crew, and vanished. In 1751, transports from Liverpool shot the captain, took the vessel to South Carolina, and fled. Fullwood's successor as chief convict contractor said, that an extraordinary number of seamen was always necessary to prevent the felons rising upon them. Moreover, their wages were always very great by reason of the nature of such a cargo. The journey took two months or more. Merchants did not get a subsidy on dead convicts, so some instructed their captains to keep their reluctant passengers healthy by incorporating ventilators, into the hall and ordering regular washing. But such considerate men were exceptional. There was money to be made by cutting supplies <coughs> and squeezing more bodies into the ship, whatever the condition. In 1767, George Selwyn MP was shocked when he visited a convict ship preparing to sail to Maryland. Maryland. Uh, let's see. I went, and this is what he wrote. I went on board, and all the horror I had an idea of is short of what I saw this poor man in chains, this poor man chained to a board in a hole not above 16 feet long. More than 50 with him. A collar and padlock about his neck and chained to five of the most dreadful creatures I've ever looked on. Wow. In the early part of the century, dysentery, smallpox, freezing temperatures, and typhoid carried off as many as one in three incoming convicts. On the owner's goodwill in 1721, 50 converts embarked and only 31 disembarked. On the Rappahannock in 1726, there were only 60 survivors out of 108 who embarked. On the forward in 1728, 96 embarked and 27 of them perished. Such appalling losses in human life were not confined to convicts yet. The voyage of the sea flower is among the most poignant of all the stories. On 31st of July, 1741, the sea flower put out of Belfast bound for Philadelphia with 106 passengers. She encountered heavy weather, sprang her mast, and was then becalmed for several weeks. Supplies of food ran out and crew and passengers began to die. By the time she made Boston on 31st October, 13 weeks after starting out, 
64 were dead, including the captain. Six of the dead had been eaten by the survivors. Among the convict carriers, some captains were notorious for their greed and sadism. One was Barnett Bond, the master of the Justicia, a merchant who employed Bond was so furious at the loss of human life and his profits that he sued Bond for murder. The captain was alleged to have cut convicts, water rations, and literally watched them die of thirst, though there was plenty of water aboard. He then grabbed anything of value the dead had been carrying. A witness, said Bond, declared himself heir to all the felons who should die under his care. Okay. He got off the charge. Okay, a witness said Bond declared himself heir to all the felons who should die under his care. He got off the charge. After greeting the incoming ship in Annapolis or Boston, the merchant's priority was advertising his cargo. Notices of arrival of the convict servants were placed in the Boston Gazette or the Virginia Gazette. Posters known as tear, tear sheets were pinned to the wall of the local bank. And this is one of the, uh, this is, I'm going to read what one of those um, uh, posters would say. Um, just give me a second to just sit right there. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. I need that. This is what the posters would say that were pinned to the coffee houses. It would say, last week arrived here from Bristol, the Snow Eugene, Captain Jonathan Talamay with 69 of His Majesty's seven-year passengers, 51 men and 18 women. Just imported from Bristol in the ship Randolph, Captain John Weber Price, 115 convicts, men, women, and lads, among whom are several tradesmen who are to be sold on board the said ship, now in Annapolis Dock, this day, tomorrow, and Saturday next. The one advertisement notifying a sale of newly arrived servants gave pride of place to other, presumably more desirable goods. It appeared in the Boston Gazette in the late 1720s, headed plaids from Glasgow. The text read, plaids of sundry sorts, both fine and ordinary, choice linens of several sorts, bed chickens, bed chickens, handkerchiefs, and muslin, not muslin, muslin, um, with some young men and women's time of service. Would be buyers examine the human merchandise, paying minute, minute attention to every limb and tooth. The convicts were, in a real sense, perishable goods. If a woman couldn't stand up to the work or was diseased, the 8 or $10 spent on buying her was wasted. With men costing 13 and upwards, the buyer was even keener on ensuring that they were sound. Those undergoing inspections or witnessing others being inspected usually drew the same parallel. Convict servant William Green recalled, they search up there as the dealers in horses do those animals in this country by looking at our teeth, viewing our limbs to see if they are sound, fit for their labor. Another ex-convict, James Rebel, put this scene in a verse as follows. Examine like horses, if we're sound. What trade are you, my lad, says one to me. A tin man, sir, that will not do, says he. Some felt our hands and viewed our legs and feet and made us walk to see if we were complete. Some viewed our teeth to see if we were good or fit to chew our hard and homely food. End of that statement. In 1758, a London weaver observed a sale of convict servants in Williamsburg, and it read like this. This is what he said. They all was set in row near 100 men and women, and the planter, 
run down the country to buy. I never see such parcels of poor wretches in my life. Some almost naked, and what had clothes was as black as chimney sweet, and almost starved by the ill usage of their passage by the captain, for they are used no better than many Negro slaves and sold in the same manner as horses or cows in our market affair. The true parallel was with our humans. What happened to white convicts on their entry to the New World was the same as what happened to Africans. Both were advertised for sale. Both were inspected and probed, and both were taken off in chains by new masters or by an agent who would find them new masters. Apart from the chain, non-criminal servants were often sold in much the same way. John Hallowell, a 40-year-old indentured servant from Scotland, kept a diary of his arrival in Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1774. On 16 May, he wrote the following. This day, several came on board to purchase servants, indentures, and among them, there were two soul drivers. They are men who make it their business to go on board all ships who have it in either servants or convicts and buy sometimes a whole and sometimes a parcel of them as they can agree. And then they drive them through the country like a parcel of sheep until they can sell them to advantage. But all went away without buying any. End that quote. The mainland colonies tried to block the resumption of convict sales. They couldn't overturn a British law, but they could sabotage it. Maryland took the lead, and in 1719, it enacted a law requiring everyone buying convicts to lodge a good behavior bond of $100 per convict. The Privy Council squashed this wrecking move inside two months. Virginia's Burgesses attempted similar tax. They ordered ship captains to give a security of 100 for each convict sold and buyers to lodge a $10 bond for their purchases good behavior, for the purchases good behavior. This, too, was vetoed by the Privy Council. So Virginia's leaders temporized, arguing that if convicts must come, they should be settled on the western frontier. The merchant Joshua G. proposed giving them frontier land and using them as bulwark against Native Americans. The influential Reverend Hugh Jones suggested workhouses for them on the frontier where they could work and become self-sufficient. None of it came to anything, and convicts poured in. The vast majority went to the Chesapeake provinces, followed a long way behind by Pennsylvania. Many of these unwilling immigrants were immediately thrust into heavy labor on the plantation, in mining, forestry, and industry. Others, the skilled amongst the convicts, were brought to be assistants in shops, printing work, and a hundred different small enterprises. According to a convict agent from Baltimore, Maryland, alone absorbed some 600 convicts a year for decade after decade. The province's governor, Horatio Sharp, commented, I could heartily wish that they, convicts, were sent to any other part of his majesty's plantation, but while we purchase them, they will send them. Quite simply, thanks to the subsidy convicts were cheap labor and too good a bargain to miss. They were a third of the price of black slaves, and while more expensive than regular indentured service, the free willers, they invariably had far longer to serve. Baltimore records show that convicts were 25 to 29 percent more expensive than other indentured service but their length of servitude was more than twice that of the average indentured period. Never, nevertheless, the market for free willers was buoyant. Fewer 
were arriving from England where the economy was picking, but many more were coming from Ireland and Scotland where poverty and want were widespread. The nature of the exodus from Ireland in the 18th century differed significantly from what had preceded it. In the 1600s, people were forcibly transported, mainly to clear the land of its Catholic population to make way for Protestant, English, and Scots. Now in the 1700s, punishment and poverty were the two driving forces. Ireland contributed convicts and free willers, as was happening to people up and down the line. The Irish were the target of the hard sell on the wonders of life in the New World. Merchants stole in America were passed hand to hand. The Dublin Weekly Journal, for instance, carried an advert in January 1735 offering Irish Protestant immigrants to New York a special deal. Land purchased from the Mohawk Indians could be rented by them for one shilling and nine pence farthing per hundred acres. Then there was a widely circulated letter that was purportedly written to a county Tyrone clergyman extolling the money-making merit of New York. It was written phonetically in a Scots dialect. If your son Samuel and John Boyd Wad but come here, they wad get my money in an year for teaching in a Latin school, nor yourself wad get for three years preaching where you are. Where you are. <laughs> uh, the letter described the Bonnie country, then gave the very high wages, wage rates for various trades and the very low price of land, and urged, I beg all ye all to come here. The letter was signed James Murray, but was most probably a fake, a piece of propaganda got up by planters or shipping agents. But the propaganda worked. In 1728, the head of the Anglican Church in Ireland, Archbishop Bolter, complained that canvassing by American agents had persuaded large numbers to emigrate, deluded with stories of great plenty and estate to be had for going for going for in these parts of the world. He continued, there are now seven ships at Belfast that are carrying off 1,000 passengers hither. However, the Archbishop then put his finger on what was really sending so many across the ocean, dire poverty. Referring to the Belfast migrants, he added as follows, if we knew how to stop them, as most of them can neither get victual nor work at home. It would be cruel to do that. And that comment. There are few reliable figures for those ships from Ireland. However, it is as convicts were deported between 1718 and 1775. In the 1740s, the Irish Parliament commissioned a report uh, into the dep deportations of felons and vagabonds. The suspicion was that merchants engaged to transport the convicts were taking their subsidies and dumping their cargoes in England. I hope I don't have to go okay. In England, Wales, or even somewhere else in Ireland. This investigation got nowhere, and the records that exist provide only snapshots of the Irish convict trade. What there is, however, tends to confirm that it was considerable. For example, over just two days in September 1766, 17 women and 1992 men, all evidently felons, were indentured before the Lord Mayor of Dublin prior to transportation. The practice of taking e-migrants, free willers, or criminals before the mayor 
had been established in an attempt to stamp out kidnapping and false indentures. They were then taken in 15 carts from prison to Sir John Rogerson's Quay, where they were put on board the Hick from Whitehaven, bound for His Majesty's plantations in America. There were brief moments of comedy in the convict deportations from Ireland. The Dublin Mercury for 9th to the 13th of June in 1767, ran this story about a transported felon, meaning as follows. Among the unfortunate transport ships out last Monday was one poor fellow who, being killed in modern fashions of hairdressing, had unluckily made two free with some of his employer's trinkets. One thing he proposed to himself might be a useful introduction to his being employed by the ladies in America, who will, like the ladies of their sister kingdom, not be outdone in mode of fashion. In that comment. By now, large-scale uses of, of labor, ranging from Virginia's great planters to the first generations of industrialists, were all turning to Africa as a major source of slaves. But they remain in the market for convicts and free willers. Will, will, will earn in what was still a transitional period in racial segregation. They had no qualms about using mixed race labor gangs. The picture of black slaves existing alone at the bottom of the heap does not hold. For a long time, white servants were with them at the bottom and treated with equal inhumanity. Indeed, there are indications from various sources that whites were in some cases treated worse than blacks. It was William William E. Edith, England's this is England's custom surveyor in Annapolis, who reckoned that African slaves were better treated than Europeans on the plantations because they were more valuable. A lifelong property, whereas European slaves mostly excuse me, but they were more valuable and a lifelong property whereas European split servants mostly had a term to their service, planters exercised an inflexible severity over white servants, he said. Uh, generally speaking, they groaned beneath a worse than Egyptian bond. In fact, nothing suffered by whites equated with the most unspeakable cases of cruelty to blacks. Whites were never limb nor castrated. Nevertheless, the death rate suggests that Edith was broadly right about their treatment. Fifty percent of convict servants were dead inside seven years. Tidewater aristocrats who came to be so completely identified as African American slave owners were among those who bought convicts. Eighteen year old petty theft John Lawson was acquired by one of them. According to his own account, he was bought on the quay side by a planter from Rappahannock and slave for 14 years. Lawson was in a plantation labor gang of 24. 18 of them were Africans and 6 were Europeans. According to Lawson, his treatment was indistinguishable from that meted out to the Africans. They were chained together. They lived together, they slept together, they worked together, and they were whipped together. White slavery wasn't confined to rural America. The archive of the Hampton Northampton Hampton Northampton Island book near Baltimore provides day to day evidence of an interrace slave workforce in operation over decades. The iron works were owned by the Ridgley family. Between seven the Ridgley's bought three hundred or so white servants most apparently convicts, and put them to work alongside black slaves. Professor Ora Kent Lancaster researched the archive and emerged with a picture of endless sweat and harsh discipline. Everywhere there was hard physical labor, feeding the furnaces, working the forge, mining the ore, selling trees for fuel, hauling the ore, and in flat times being put on farm work. Time books, catalogs, near perpetual toil. Colliers worked 
a 26-day month with only Sundays free year after year. The only time off at Christmas was on the 28th of December, which the quote described as Chilliness Day. <laughs> Chilliness Day. Indentured servants were exploitable for a limited time only, and that time could not be wasted on the niceties of holidays. Professor Lancaster explains as follows. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Professor Lancaster explains the above mentioned. Now, the Ridgelies made money not just by working servants, but also from buying and selling them. Professor Lancaster uncovered a profitable little deal done by Captain Charles Wrigley in 1769. He bought 11 men for $12 each and nine women at $9 each. Within two months, he had sold seven of the women for between 10 and 15 a head and eight or nine men for between 17 and 30 a head. Men and women continually tried to escape. A document dated 1772 and headed Description of White Workers contained the profile of 88 men and women laborers and had been compiled for use if, or rather when, they escaped. When a man called Francis Barrett vanished in the summer of 1775, Captain Ridgely used his profile. Oh, excuse me, I've got to write down the word profile because that's what's happening now. Okay, used his profile in the description file for a runaway notice in the Maryland Gazette. This described Barrett and noted that he had also an iron collar on. The collar was apparently fitted after a previous escape attempt and left on to facilitate his return to the furnace site. The servant's legal right to take grievances to court is revealed as virtually worthless. Time and again, over 50 years, Ridley, servant, went to court, usually claiming they were being held beyond their time. And there is only a single instance of the court finding in against the company. Moreover, every unsuccessful servant litigant found him or herself listed as a runaway and penalized, very probable, probably by serving extra time. Giveaway references to neck rings, iron collars, a company jail and whipping appeared in the archive. There was also a letter from an English doctor denouncing the Ridgelies for cruelty to their servants. The Ridgelies were typical, judging from David Wildstriker, Wildstriker, excuse me, studied runaway, study of runaway America. Much available evidence suggests that the risk to and the possibility for profit drove masters to treat their bondsmen with a cruelty and lack of care, more often associated with the slave society of the Caribbean. One of the justifications of earlier English moves to dump the unwanted in America was redemption of their soul. Mm. Wait a minute, let me read that again. One of the justifications of earlier English moves to dump the unwanted in America was redemption of their soul. The idea of villains finding their salvation in the tough crimes of Virginia was voiced by Sir Humphrey Gilbert James I, John Donne, and a galaxy of others. However, it did not feature in the 1717 Transportation Act, nor were convicts offered a glimpse of eventual salvation after arriving in America. In 1749, Virginia's burgesses decided that even when a convict's term was served, and even if he or she became a successful landowner, they would be second-class citizens forever. Ex-convicts were denied the right to vote, and in this, they were grouped with children and slaves. In contrast, the lot of non-convict servants seemed to improve. They were still being imported, but in a smaller number. In 1753, the Virginia Assembly imposed a five-year maximum on the time and services to be served by poor immigrants arriving without indentures. 
The same law tries to deter mass laying it on every owner as an obligation to care for sick or lame servants during their whole period of service. But in other ways, nothing changed. Indented servants were still chattel, and the Virginia Assembly reminded them of their place. In the 1750s, the Virginia Assembly, I'm sorry, in the 1750s, it extended earlier legislation ordering complete obedience to masters. Servants who disobeyed their owners' just and lawful commands and resist or offer violence to masters, mistress, or overseers had a year more of servitude added for each offense. Punishment for runaway servants will also increase yet again. As for the prospects of service, after they eventually attained freedom, they appear to have diminished as colonies developed developed and became, excuse me, let me reread that. As for the prospects of servants after they eventually attained freedom, they appear to have diminished as colonies developed and became more stratified. In Down and Out in Early America, that's a book called In Down and Out in Early America by Gary B. Nash, he quotes data showing this to be the case in Maryland after the 1660s and in Pennsylvania after the 1740s. Nearly three out of four servants freed in Pennsylvania ended up on the public dole and only a handful ever became property holders. In many eyes, all servants and not just convict servants were scum. So thought the Reverend Hugh Jones, a professor in the 1720s and 1730s at America's first greater, great seat of learning, the William and Mary College, which is as follows. The servants and inferior sort of people who have either been sent over to Virginia or have transported themselves thither have been and are the poorest, idlest, and worst of mankind, the refuse of Great Britain and Ireland, and the outcast of the people. And that sentence. The Reverend Jones thought the convicts among them had nothing to complain about. Their being sent thither to work as slaves for punishment is but a mere notion, for few of them ever lived so well and so easy before. Was there an especially southern bias against service? The Columbia University historian Richard Hofstadter thought so. He suggested that the plantation practice of buying both convict and non-convict servants and so putting honest, unfortunate, and hardened criminals together caused them to be lumped all together as rogues who deserve no better than what was meted out to them. However, in New England, where convicts were sold and there were not many free willers, there was just as much distaste for servants. Judging from a withering article in the Boston Gazette in 1725, the main target was Irish servants who were then overtaking the English on the migrant ship. And here's a quote from that. The masters of servants going to Ireland knowing the great want of servants here pick up all the vagabonds they can find to make a cargo. Fellows and wenches brought up to no other employment than the picking of St. Patrick's vermin and driving them out of their stronghold. They serve us for no other purposes than to play their masters and mistresses and to debauch their children. This gives us an ill opinion of foreigners, especially those coming from Ireland, when the truth of it is the best of them stay at home and generally the very scum of the nation, both freemen and servants, servants visit the plantation. End quote. Few servants were in a position to argue their own case, and we know very little about them as individuals. One exception is Elizabeth Spriggs, whose pathetic letter, Utah, as that that was penned by that other indentured servant, Richard Friesland, 134 years earlier. And it reads as follows. <clears throat> 
Um, just give me one second. One second, everybody. Hold on. All right, I had to get straight, and I had to take a sip of my trash's echinacea and ginger tea. So I'm good now. All right, so we are at the point where we're reading a letter. Um, uh, okay, let me. Few servants were in a position to argue their own case, and we know very little about them as individuals. One exception, though, is Elizabeth Briggs, whose pathetic letter home in 1756 was as desperate and futile as that was penned by that other indented servant, Richard Freethorn, 134 years later. So, in his letter, it says, Honest Father, my being forever banished from your sight, will I hope pardon of the boldness I now take of troubling you with these. My long silence has been purely only to my undutifulness to you, and well knowing I had offended in the highest degree, but a tie to my tongue and pen for fear, put a tie to my tongue and pen for fear I should be extinct from your good graces and add a further trouble to you, but to well knowing your care and tenderness for me so long as I retain my duty to you, induce me once again to endeavor, if possible, to kindle up that flame again. Oh, dear Father, believe what I am going to relate the words of truth and sincerity and balance my former bad conduct, my suffering here, and then I am sure you'll pity your distressed daughter. What we unfortunate English people suffer here is beyond the probability of you in England to conceive. Let it suffice that I, one of the unhappy number, am toiling almost day and night, and very often in the horse's drudgery, with only this comfort that you bitch, you do not have enough, and then tied up and whipped to that degree that you do not serve an animal, scarce and anything but Indian corn, and salt to eat, and that even begrudge nay many Negroes, and that even begrudge, nay, many Negroes are better used, almost naked, no shoes, no stockings to wear, and the comfort after slavery during master's pleasure. What rest we can get is to wrap ourselves up in a blanket and lie upon the ground. This is the deplorable condition your poor Betty endured. And now I beg, if you have any bowels of compassion left, show it by sending me some relief. Clothing is the principal thing wanting, which, if you should condescend to, may easily send them to me by any other ship bound to Baltimore town. Honored father, your undutiful and disobedient child, Elizabeth Frey. That's her letter, and her letter to her father. So, her father did not reply because he never received his daughter's letter. England and France were at war, and a French man of war captured the vessel, taking the letter to England. Then the Royal Navy Navy captured the Frenchman, and all the paperwork it carried was sent to the Admiralty. Elizabeth Frick's letter lay in the Admiralty vault unread for 300 years. Years. We can only speculate the young woman's fate. There is an amazing resource that tells us a lot more about the 18th century servant. It is the hundreds of runaway ads placed in the colonial press by masters hunting escaped servants. In the 19th century, the quarry was the runaway black slave. In much of the 18th century, the runaway was more likely to be white. There is no more vivid an insight into this class of people than the wanted notices that were posted by their masters. 
The selection below is from the Maryland Gazette, the Virginia Gazette, and the Pennsylvania Gazette. It covers regular indentured servants and convict servants. There were always many Irish amongst the escapers. All right, hold on, read that. Now, 20 pounds. <laughs> How interesting. Remember earlier when I was reading, I told you that the L was a lira, but it's actually a pound, that little L sign. 20 pounds reward. Runaway from Alexander, Fairfax County, Virginia. A convict service man named... Oh, hold on. 20 pounds reward. Runaway from Alexandria, Fairfax County, Virginia, a convict servant man named John Murphy, born in Ireland, about 28 years of age, by trade a joiner, a low set fella, about five four, five feet four inches high, struck in his walk, has a pale complexion, large black beard, and eyebrows, wide mouth, and pleasant countenance. Things extraordinarily well, having followed it in the playhouses in London, talked proper English, talked proper English, and and that in a polite manner. It is imagined he has forged a path and likely will deny his name, trade, and place of nativity. And B, all masters of vessels are forbid to take him off at their peril. And that was on the 1760. Run away, here's another one, run away from the subscriber living in Lancaster, a native Irish servant woman named Katie Norton, who came from the county of Wicklow in Ireland last fall. She is about 25 or 26 years of age, of a dark complexion, has black hair, talks in the Irish dialect, rocks in her walk, and is pretty sharp in talking. She is a cunning hussy and no doubt will pass a while for an honest woman, as she has good clothes with her and can behave herself. Whoever takes up said woman and brings her to the subscriber in Lancaster shall have three pounds reward and reasonable charges paid by me, Robert Fulton, that's July 1763. Big. Okay, that is, okay, there were many English born runaways too. So we just talked about the Irish one. Now, there were many English born runaways too, including one who presumably had something on her master. <laughs> and it reads as follows Runaway, last night from the workhouse in Chester. A servant girl that belonged to Thomas Blair in West New Jersey. She was advertised some time ago in this cassette by the name of Elizabeth Burke, but changes her name often. She's about 18 years of age, of small stature, dark complexion, and speaks much through her nose. Had on a blue calamanco gown, striped Lindsay petticoat, and a black silk bonnet, was barefooted. Four pounds reward and reasonable charges. And B, I desire that all persons would take notice of this advertisement and secure the girl wherever found, as it will ruin me if she is not got and not to believe what she says, as she will certainly tell many lies. July 1st, 1756. Now, there were some runaways looked like murderers. All right. As follows. Run away. On the 20th instant, four convict serving men, Englishmen, Francis Wignall, a stout, able fellow, and about five foot ten inches. Stephen DeVoe, a grim looking, lusty fellow, and much pitted with the smallpox. James Trump, a yellow complexion, has a remarkable stabbed head and wears on it a striped worsted cap and felt hat. John Hennis walks very lame, 
occasioned by one leg being much shorter than the other. Reward, 20 shillings per servant. That's June 1766. Some runaways were murderers. Another one. Whereas Alexander Jameson and John's two servant men belonging to me as they were returning from Norfolk in a small schooner, did barbarously murder Mr. Tobias Horton, their skipper, his body having been since found on the bay shore nigh Windmill Point, and ran away with the vessel. As Jameson has been used to go by, by water, has been used to go by water, they will probably pass for sailors and endeavor to make their escape by getting on board some vessel outward bound. Wherefore, it is expected all commanders will strictly examine their crew before sailing to prevent, if possible, the escape of such barbarous murderers. And that was in September 1745. So, a great many servants carried scars, most from disease, but some from whipping. Here's another post as follows. Ran away last month, a convict servant man named Edward Ormsby. He is an Irishman of a low stature, has an impediment in his feet. He is supposed to be has gone away in company with a mulatto woman known by the name of Anne Riley. Elliot Bush, who being whipped last court held for the county of King George, may possibly have the mark on her back. Two pistol reward, two pistols reward besides what the law allows, and that's in April thirty-seven. James Brennan, an Irishman born about twenty years of age, an Irishman born about twenty years of age much afflicted with the kick, kick seat, and jaundice. And if observed, is much scarring about the arms and many other parts of his body. And that's October 1753. And then we have ran away from the subscriber in Richmond County, two servants, a man and a woman. The man named Brian Kagan is tall, is a tall, thin man, about 50 years of age. Where's his own black hair? I'm sorry. Where's his Where's his own black hair? That's what it said. Had on when he went away a dark brown coat, a blue great great coat, and a pair of blue plush breeches. The woman named Mary Ramshire is of a middle age and stature, a fresh complexion, has several scars on her face, and one on her arm. Five pounds reward besides what the law allows. That's June 1738. All right. Many servants fled in groups, and they must have been easy to spot unless they got to New York or to Boston and lost themselves in the crowd. So here is an advertisement for a group of people. Says ran away on Tuesday night. Four servant men visit John Tomlin, Tomlin, a tall, thin fellow, about 26 years old, very much disfigured with the smallpox. John Minor, a tall, well-set fellow, about the same age. He had on a light, drab coat and breeches with a white wig. Thomas Lee, a tall, thin man, a convict, has lost one of his fingers. George Berry, a lad about 16 or 17 years of age, a convict. And that was in April 1738. So frequently such advertisements featured black slaves and white servants who, as in the 1600s, were still fighting back together, often by running away together. Here's an advertisement for that. Ran away on Saturday the 15th instant at night from Mr. Humphrey Brook in King William County, a servant man named John Harris, a Welsh man, a Negro man named Abraham, belonging to Colonel George Braxton, and a Negro man named Windsor, belonging to the subscribers. The Negroes are both Virginia-born and are sensible fellows. They went away by water 
and his foes will endeavor for Carolina, the eastern shore, or up the bay. July 1738. Ran away, a Negro man named Temple, about 35 years old, well set, about five to six inches high, has about five feet six inches high, has a high forehead and thick bushy beard. He took a, a gun with him, likewise run away to indented service imported from London last September. There's John Wayne, age 22 years, about five feet four inches high, round shoulders, stoops pretty much in his walk, has a down look, and understands plowing. William Cantwell of Warwickshire, age 19, about the same height, and stoops a little. And that's in May 1766. Some of the runaways appear to have been lovers who, of course, face a year or two extra service if they were ever caught in the act by their masters. Run away. A servant named Nathaniel McDowell, about 30 years of age, wears his own black hair, round face, and rough features. As it is known, an intimate between him and a neighboring woman, the wife of Alexander Logan, who left her husband about the same time and took her child with her, a promising boy, six years old, with white hair. It is thought they are gone together and that they will go to Philadelphia. Three pounds reward, May 1763. Run away, ran away, sorry. A servant man named Patrick Flood. He is a pretty tall, lusty fellow of a black swaggy complexion. He took with him a young bay mare with a star in her forehead and one white foot. He went in company with one Sarah Carroll who formerly traveled to Carolina, where they are both suspected to be gone. She is a tall, slender woman with a wry look and a swarthy complexion. Four pistols reward, March 1738. Next, five pistols reward ran away from the subscriber in Fairfax County, an English indented servant woman named Elizabeth Bushel, about 23 years of age of a low stature, fair skin, black eyes, black hair, a scar on her breast, and loves drink. It is suspected she was carried away by Captain Tipple Boatswain from Potomac, from the Potomac River to Patuxent, where the ship lies, or that he has left her at the mouth of the river. Whoever takes up the said servant and brings her to her master, They'll have five pistols reward besides what the law allows, and five pistols more if it can be proved that the said boatswain conceals her. November 1745. Of all the escapees, the most spectacular was surely Sarah Wilson, a servant to one of the Queen's maids of honor. She was arrested in London in 1771 after the disappearance of some of the Queen's jewels, and she was transported to Maryland. The London magazine reported that on land, she was exposed to sale and purchase. Uh, I'm sorry. The London magazine reported that on landing, she was exposed to sale and purchase, but escaped. Wilson assumed, assumed the title of the Prince's Stefana Carolina Matilda, non-existent to the Queen. And in a whirlwind tour of the Eastern Seaboard con colonial American society, the London Magazine told the story as follows. He traveled from one gentleman's house to another under these pretensions, making astonishing impressions in many places affecting the mode of royalty so innocently that many had the honor to kiss her hand. To some, she promised government. To others, regiment. 
with promotions of all kinds in the Treasury, Army, and the Royal Navy. At last, however, an advertisement appeared and a messenger arrived from her master who raised a loud hue and cry for her serene highness. So the game was up. She was caught in Charleston, and one of the history's more colorful impostors was dragged back to the man who bought her. He was forced to serve for another two years. Hostility to convict servants grew as more and more were imported and crime levels increased. The Virginia Gazette complained in 1751 as follows. When we see our papers filled continually with accounts of the most audacious robberies, the most cruel murders, and infinite other villainies perpetrated by convicts that transported from Europe, what melancholy, what terrible reflections it must occasion. What will become of our posterity? These are some of thy favorite Britons. That are called our mother country. But what good mother ever sent thieves and villains to accompany her children to corrupt some with their infectious vices and murder the rest? What father ever endeavored to spread a plague in his family? And what can Britain show a more sovereign contempt for us than by emptying their jails into our settlement? Unless they would likewise empty their Jake's privy on our table. That same year, Virginia's attorney general was given a wage raise because of the increase in the number of criminals he was prosecuting. Mm. It was not unreasonable for him to blame British convicts for his extra workload. In the 1750s, Benjamin Franklin, America's most gifted populist, planted himself at the head of demanding an end to the convict trade. Writing in his paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, he famously suggested that in return for convicts, rattlesnakes should be sent to every member of the British Parliament, both peers and MPs. And this is what he wrote as follows. Rattlesnakes being the most suitable returns for the human serpent sent us by our mother country. In this, however, as in every other branch of trade, she will have the advantage of us. She will reap equal benefits without risk of the inconveniences and dangers. For the rattlesnake gives warning before he attempts his mischief, which the convict does not. <laughs> End statement. More attempts were made to restrict the trade. In 1754, Maryland slapped a 20 shilling per head duty on convicts. Such was the British government's enthusiasm for transportation that merchants knew they could safely defy the colony's law. The issue burst into flame again in the 1760s, this time ignited by fear of epidemics, outbreaks of yellow fever, smallpox, typhoid, and other Typhoid sorry, and other infectious diseases were an increasingly worrying feature of the packed migrant ships coming into Boston, Baltimore, and other ports along the eastern seaboard. In the 1740s, a quarantine post was established at Fisher Island outside Philadelphia. But when Virginians and Marylanders wanted the right to quarantine ships, including convict ships, merchants pressurized the crown to stamp on the idea. The disease most feared was endemic to the English prison, a truly fearful strain of typhoid known as Dow fever. Sir Francis Bacon described it as the most pernicious infection next to the plague. The symptoms were a sudden headache followed by chills and stomach pain that could drag on for about three weeks or kill within hours. On one notorious day in the spring of 1750, gal fever hit the Royal Court of Justice in the heart of London and reportedly killed more than 50 people within a day, including four judges, the Lord Mayor of London, four counsel, the undersheriff, and 40 jurors. 
numerous outbreaks and suspected outbreaks occurred in America following convict shipment. They culminated in July 1767 when the fever infected a plantation outside Baltimore, reportedly killing 30 African-American slaves as well as the owner of the plantation. A newly arrived convict was the presumed carrier, and the Merlin Gazette set a panic rolling with a vivid report on the fury of this malignant, ravaging pestilence that was spread by a casual visit, it seems, from one of the felons, sometime since imported in a convict ship. The Chesapeake was gripped by rumors of other outbreaks. As one of the Tidewater grandees put it, a bare suspicion of that terrible disorder is enough to make a whole country tremble. The Maryland Assembly demanded quarantine control, and Governor Horatio Sharp urged London to allow restrictions. Scores of people have been destroyed here by the jail fever first communicated by servants from on board crowded in sexual ships is notorious, he wrote. But London was not interested in allowing anything to impede the westward flow of convicts. Proposed restrictions were watered down and then vetoed by London. A bitter statement from Maryland's assembly followed, assemblymen followed, blaming the Crown and greedy convict contractors who had lobbied against restrictions. The statement condemned the contractors for esteeming the health of the inhabitants light, light in the scale against, excuse me, the statement condemned the contract taxes for esteeming the health of the inhabitants as light in the scale against a grain of their profit and for lobbying in England, country from which they have extracted so much wealth and at the expense of so many lives. Benjamin Franklin now returns to the attack. He penned an article for the London Chronicle labeling transportation as the most cruel insult offered by one people to another. It was he wrote an, an unexpected, it was he who wrote an unexpected barbar, barbarity in your government to empty your gals into our settlement, and we resent it as the highest of insults. None of this made any difference. The convict trade was now so profitable with convicts fetching such good prices uh, that in 1772, the British government decided to end the subsidy. <laughs> the following year, approaching 1,000 convicts, the following year approaching 1,000 convicts were sold. It took war and independence to end the trade. Wow, this is so interesting. Mm. The British government stopped shipments when the first serious fighting of the American War of Independence broke out at Arlington and Concord in April 1775. The business of acquiring new convict servants went on until the very last minute, and so did the pursuit of the runaways. On 21st of April, two days after the war began, planters posted notices in the Virginia Gazette offering rewards for 10 runaways. Two of the escapees were Negro slaves. The other eight were white servants. Among the servants sought were a 20-year-old joiner from Bristol, Thomas Pierce, and the rather older William Webster, a Scotch brick maker. The man pursuing them at this hour of national need was the Virginia planter soldier, are you ready, George Washington. Whoa. Let's read that paragraph again. The business of acquiring new convict servants went on until the very last minute, and so did the pursuit of the runaway. So on the April 21st, two days after the war began, planters posted notices in the Virginia Gazette offering rewards for 10 runaways. Two of those escapees were Negro slaves. The other eight were white servants. Among the servants sought were a 20-year-old joiner from Bristol. Thomas Pierce, and the rather older William Webster, Webster, a Scotch brickmaker. The man pursuing them at this hour of national need was the Virginia planner and soldier George Washington. Wow. 
So he <laughs> um, was on the pursuit. Now, let me see what the time is. Great, perfect, because, see, I like this. We were going to do the last two um, chapters, but you know what? We're not. We're going to start right here because we're going to have discussion, and guess what? And we will have the opportunity still to do the last chapter of this book, if he can. If not, of course, you know, we'll, I'll be here, and we'll be doing what we do. Because that was a long chapter. I think it's appropriate. Now, the only thing I need to do, ah, I made it with my cold, is to make sure I have the phone number up correct. And I just need to know if... I don't know the numbers for let's see, let's see, let's see there. I'm looking for a sim. All right, wow, this is really interesting. See, who do we have the five one oh three three four? You're live on the air. Islam. Greetings and it's peace. Me. This is uh Anthony Shekel Bay. I'm calling from the hey, how you how are you? Good. Good. Great. Good. How are you? Well, oh, well, I'm catching a little, you know, cold, but I'm, you know, broadcast my show on type thing. And uh, I'm glad that you, I'm going to ask you about your comments, but I am still looking for, um, let's see, I'm looking for a sim. I don't know if I got his sim because that it usually has, uh, um, oh, here we go. Hold on one second, Anthony. Sure. Chick secret. Got to press one. Got to press one. No, no, no. Let me see. Let me join in. There he is, but he doesn't have one press. Um, let's see. He just did. To the top. All right, Anthony, you're on the line. Stay with us. And there he is. Is this a sim? It's long. It's long. How are you? Oh, oh my well. goodness. Now let me just open up Bakari also. All right. I know Bakari is the seven one nine, I believe. Is this brother Bakari? Seven one nine two three two. Seven one nine two three two. All right. Islam, yes, it is. Bakari? Peace and love. Yes, I'm here. All right, so we've got Bakari, we've got Brother Tim, and we've got Anthony Shankel. Um, uh, you know, I always have to say Anthony Shankel, but, you know, Anthony has just a, it just has a rhyme to it. It's just a flow, you know. All of us <laughs> on the line of Bays and Ills and Ali. So, but but um, uh, to discuss this, I think it's appropriate if we end right here and have discussion on this. And this, like I said, this is an opportunity for the very last chapter, which is 19, and it's called The Last to Rock. Now, I, I, I just got to say, I was taking notes, as I know you guys uh, always do, and I know that um, I know that you, uh, Asin, and I think Bakari as well, are already read through this, you know, are ahead of the chapters. But that that whole thing reminded me, was I was writing it as I was, you know, trying to take notes on it. The same thing they do today is what they've done. It's, it's, it's the same thing, you know. Uh, and look at the bonds. They got the bonds. They've got um, it's the fact that they use America, the land, American land, as really as a, a as a as a dunk. You know what I mean? When when we hear that they brought over criminals and and and, and people from the galleys that were murderers and criminals, it's true. And then this last thing here, well, I mean, we could go through it, but my goodness, there was some other notes that I wrote that I wrote down as well. Um, oh, they were talking about the slave ships now. What I found interesting is the way they described how the these are Irish, these are modern Europeans, not 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 you know us Moors called Negro colors and black. Most of them, which they've identified as Irish, etc., like that. And what was the Irish and French or something? The, the way they described how they were tied together on the boats. Remember how we believed that was us? Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Wow, it's it's really interesting. So, uh, um, you know, and then it was a few other things um, that oh oh when they talked about uh, the it reminded me of the probate court the probate court now which is really like a surrogate mom uh, surrogate womb 
um, where they could they weren't allowed to do anything without coming through their masters or whatever like that. It's it's slavery. It's bureaucratic slavery still going on today. That's wow. my take yes. on that. Yeah. What what do you think of that, Sam? Oh, I think that's right. I want to let the brother that you you put in the t- in the um, key first, if he had to speak before oh, yeah. I go in on oh. that, if you don't mind. All right. Very good. Brother Anthony, <laughs> thank you. What's up? What what say you? Well, I, just, I had a, this a little small one that uh, I remember hearing African-American um, in there, and it was my idea that that didn't come in until the 70s with uh, Jesse Jackson. Are they trying to do some revisionist I did in that part well, of it? Um, I, well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think that what it is is that when they're saying African-American, they're talking in – um, this, this modern time, you know what I mean? Like, remember where people were, like, because they would use black also, and they'll use Negro, mm-hmm. and then they said African American. So I want to find exactly where that page is, but I read that. But I think that's just commentary of when the person was actually writing the book. When, when, when was this book written? Do we right, know? I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that sounds. Yeah. And a lot of that times sounds, we have to remember when right. people writing books, they don't know what to call us. Because remember, we're people who keep calling ourselves, you know, it's like, for instance, and this is a great point, so we're people who keep, you know, every 20 years with something else. So if you were, mm-hmm. you know, revising something or, as you, as you mentioned, or writing something uh, with records from a long time ago, because as you can see, they have records from uh, ship records and, and letters and stuff from a long time ago as well then what would you call us? <laughs> you know what I mean? When you're speaking of us from that, a third person, current day, what would you say? You know? Exactly. Like if they said Moors, if they said enslaved Moors throughout all of this, you know, that would be one thing. But with us, there's so many different, you know, um, right. things. They don't know what to say. They want to be politically correct. Should I call them African Americans? Should I call them Africans? <laughs> you know, Negroes, whatever. Yeah. Well, but to speak to that though, the the writer, uh, the writer, was showing when he was sort of going into um, documents when he was talking about the uh, uh, mulatto and the um, yeah. suave. Yeah. So he yeah. was talking from old um, things that when he was doing his research, and if you look at the time period, though, you see when. The word uh, uh, the Negro come into existence here in America now too, but now the African American thing I do agree with you. I think that was from his own perspective. It know? was. If but you go back okay. and read that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the Negro to thing clear up, to clear something up, and then it's him. I just want to interject for a second. Let's be clear. When you, you making a very good point, when they were reading some of the stuff that was posted, it never said African American. It said, I, I right. call that too. Wasi and I call mulatto. Yes. So, and yeah, Negro. Sorry. And Negro. Yeah, and Negro, but after to understand. Yeah, it's under the sta- it's under, it, we must understand uh, um, those constructed entities that they uh, was making up mm-hmm. at that time because, you know, when you talk about the Negro, you could have been talking about a Native Amer- uh, American. Yeah. You know that they mixed in with that, you know. So um, After the we see. Yes. It's, that's, yes, that's when they started saying that. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, the and what, is, what do we know? We were coined in seventeen what seventy four with those brands. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. So, um, we ready to from a perspective of, of uh, that was all the brother had to say. Was it any more? Well, there was other things. That, there was a, one more, on, on, kind of like on the same one, where we say Scots, because that we were the only ones on the planet. And uh, when Scots doesn't that mean dark people, as as well on the same kind right, of right, right, right. Um, right. The, so when you still, ones. No, that's a good one because when you study that area where. We're, um, the slave trade was going on to, you have to go into, like, 
uh, uh, 300 B.C., 500 B.C., 1700 B.C., and then you know where that comes from, you know, and how they evolved in there, but they still call them Scots or uh, uh, Celtics and, and that thing. So, I mean, um, you, you, you on to it, yes. Yes, but they continued well, yes. that name. And that's what right, they do. Right. Remember, if, have you read all of the book? Have you been listening to all of the um, broadcasts or caught up with it or read it yourself? Because in it, they, you know, it starts out all modern European slaves, but then I think it was two or maybe three or four chapters back, I'm not sure, when they said they started getting, um, you know, the Negro or what, depending on when the you write it. Yeah, they, yeah, they use the term African uh, Yes, because we know right. that, you know, when they were doing their slavery, they went to the Ivory Coast. We know that that's right there at um, Ellis Island. They then, because slavery was a commodity, and that they, they went there and they did get some off of the um, the coast there. So they called them right. Africans. They noticed that. So then they started realizing, so that was like a, a point for me in this book. They started realizing, too, we're better off getting, you know, the uh, uh, quote unquote African states because they're stronger. They have, you know what I mean. They they, right. they recognize that. Yeah, I just wanted to add that also. Yeah, they had more Perfect. skill sets. That too. Yes, sir. That yeah, and body absolutely. and body body endurance. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. Uh. uh chapter. Um. Uh, Eleven. Uh. I'm looking at it. Uh. uh that's the one where. I, I believe it was titled, uh, 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 yeah, Planter, the the Planter from Angola. And uh, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, that, that was where they broke down the, uh, it, uh, where they did, talked about, I'm just, I'm just going to read the, uh, the, the statement here for the chapter. Uh, uh, the idea that Africans were Virginia's first slaves. Hold on, is, is this revealed- speaking? Excuse me. Yes. You didn't say it's just focus. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah. It, 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 uh, 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 to the point about the the uh, uh, Af- so, uh, so-called Africans in, in Chapter uh, 11, it states, that, which was entitled The Planter from Angola, the idea mm-hmm. that Africans were Virginia's first slaves is revealed as a myth through the story of one who became a planter himself and went on to own whites as well as blacks. Wow. But I, I, um, I, uh, tell you what, I, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, that was a good point. So are we going to go into 19 or are we going to, uh, no, I, I mean I'm sorry, not 1918. I'm gonna give you more that. No, we just read 18. The last chapter is 19, but I think we should just stop right here, and that gives an opportunity for Sister Anna East to be able to okay. be a part of the last chapter and just have the discussion on this because it was a pretty long chapter, so we can go here. Okay. I enjoyed. Uh, uh, I was gonna say I en- I enjoyed. Islam. I enjoyed uh, the, the, the the versions where we, where we were hearing different. Um, I think it was in 1724, where uh, ships were taken over by the captives, and um, they were either taken over the ship, killing all the crewmen, and just walking right off the boat. I, I don't know if that was South Carolina, but the, I, I loved hearing. Those different uh, events that took place, they documented it. Where it's like, forget you, we're 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 breaking ourselves free, taking over, and leaving. I enjoyed um, hearing that part of the chapter eighteen. Oh, yeah, and, 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 and yeah. yeah, they were real. They were real damn criminals. <laughs> They was, they was real criminals. Uh, yeah. You know, what else they had to lose? They were criminals. I'm, you know, we get locked up. I'm breaking out of here. You know? So, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. But I want to go in 
on, you know, how he started this here chapter. And he started this chapter during the winter Sussex, uh, the 23rd, December 1769. Uh, and also, wow. we know 1769, the Revolutionary War went on from 1765 to 1783. So it also was this war stirring and going on on the continent also during uh, uh, the later part of this year. But he started off at that 1769, and then you see when he um, digressed and then kept coming back and forth in this chapter. When he talks, he puts some keys in this here thing when he talks about the Spanish succession in 1714 uh, also because we know in that area where the white slaves was coming from, it was an also while that trade and stuff was going on, they was financing the war there because uh, 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 they were consolidating between uh, um, and, and bringing about what they call later on, I guess around 1707 or so, uh, um, the uh, uh, consolidation and became the uh, United Kingdom or the uh, uh, the Kingdom, but before that, you had England, and England was just a little city like Philadelphia. You had Welsh, you had the Welsh, you had the Ireland, you had Scotland, and and you got to get a map so you can see this here and put this thing in perspective. That area, and um, they they was using the nationality of the people. And what they did, if you read earlier, like uh, Raj was saying, the early chapters on when the gentrification took on, took off with uh, uh, um, um, Gilbert and uh, um, uh, Sir Walter Riley when they went in, slaughtered, and then they start bringing in their own people, you know, to uh, take over the land. So they practiced that, all right, and, and they was perfecting that at that time. So um, I just wanted to put that in the minds of the people because the gentrification still continued here on mm. this continent, all right, with the natives and, and with us. That you Remember, keep in mind, a lot of us was already here, already here, yeah. all right? And don't lose sight of that when they throw this African slave trade into this here thing. All right, and it was nobles, and we were nobles, and we were some of the ones when Rise was talking earlier about uh, the redemption and understanding this thing, you know, for our uh, prodigy and everything to know the truth. Just like we need to know the truth, they, the European or Abians, they need to know the truth also because it's just as detrimental to them, to a lot of them. Yeah. Also. So they need to know the truth, too. So uh, um, it was a lot of Moors that was already here that was buying some of those slaves. All right? Was buying some of those avions. And so how this thing went is that they put in, like, a purchase order. Like, what was going on in, in, in England, they was, like, the judges here was getting the kickback. So they were snatching up. Everybody for having, for instance, picture in your mind, you walk some young boy, 14, 15 years old, a young man walking down the street, smoking, uh, unconscious, bro, smoking a, a joint. He gets accosted, gets locked up, and then get put in transportation. All right? Mm -hmm. It's the same concept that was going on there. All right? And so... You go to you go to the court or to the trib tribunal. They want some fiat, so they already the judges already got a deal with the uh, uh, here on the continent with America. Listen, send us more. They lock them up, and let's say they get two or uh, let's say they get one pound a person because you know it was thousands they was locking up and understand this. White slave trade wasn't going on just to this continent. It was being done spread around the world now when you really start studying this here thing. All right? So yeah. these judges was 
snatching up the, the young boy who smoked the joint going through the neighborhood, snatching them up. Young sisters who was out after 10 o'clock, locked them up for curfew. All right, you going to transportation. Go before the judge. He know he's already, he, he needs to make a 100 pounds. So he know 100 people coming before him this week. I got 100 bucks coming and they gone. So get this here <laughs> conception in your mind. This judge is making money sitting them on the ship. All right. Now, mm. the contractors they talking about are the ones who are, um, is doing the transporting. This is a whole industry going on now. This is how they was making huge and huge amounts of money. So they say, okay, uh, um, somebody here on the American continent put in an a, a order. Like you go online and you put in an order for 10 books. They fill the order put them on the ship, the transportation, like they trans, like you transport those books through UPS. <laughs> it's already paid for. They put them on the ship, bring them over here. Now, this is how crew these captains and stuff were. They take the order, and they say, okay, forget that. They, they only buying it for five pounds. I'm going to take them over there, drop them off somewhere else, and get seven or eight pounds a person for them. That's how slick they were, all right? And that's called the middleman. Now, some of them was delivered to the uh, planners and things like that, and, uh, um, um, you know, they were sold on the market. They doubled their money or made uh, uh, a third of their uh, uh, um, um, currency or whatever. they. I, I hate to call it money. But um, but mm. because sugar was money, tobacco was money, cotton was money, you know. So if you understand that, so they got whatever pounds and, and whatnot for that. So this is the projection I'm putting in the people's head while we're going on with this here, how you should lo be looking at this here thing, that this is a whole industry that's going on. And when it comes to us as Moors and our part in it, Understand and don't lose the focus. A lot of us was already here, and some of us was involved in the European slave trade also, as well as buying some of the Africans that was coming over here. So, you know, the truth is the truth. So let's not shake that like we're afraid to say that, because I know some more don't want to talk about that or this and that. But let's not shake that. You know, we are them been through a redemption period and we are a pure and clean nation and we working towards that you know as a people and ho as a whole but that was the mm. perspective of the history itself though all right so saying all that you see how they were giving these subsidies and they're giving these subsidies today and they called it a subsidy of five head or, or what was it right five dollars a head and uh, uh, they brought them here. Three and five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three and five ahead. And then some of them would get on the ship earlier, like a, 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 a day trader. He goes on the ship early and say, listen, give me 20 of them. And he'll march them around the country, and, and he'll probably get the best ones and sell them for, you know, 10, 15. They said some of them were sold as much as up to 30. $30. I want to say $30 instead of the pounds. Yeah, they call them, so this what do they call them? The soul, the soul sellers or the soul buyers, something like that. Right. They would do what you Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was mm -hmm. a whole industry that, that um, evolved itself out of that, that thing, and mm -hmm. they was making that money like that, you know. And, and to our point, when we always talking about uh, – uh, they said 100 million slave uh, Africans was brought over here. We see from what this dude is documenting here that if he had 100 or 110, 13 on his ship, you know, only 40 to 60 percent of his cargo made it here. Mm. You know, when he's talking yeah. about that, when you put the math to it, it comes to only 40 or 60 percent. And if they had a storm or something like that where they ran out of water, where you see in there they started eating, you know, 
themselves and the dead and stuff like that. Hell no, don't throw him overboard. We eating him tonight. You know, that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. was, that's what was going on. You know, and so only 40 to 60 percent of that uh, 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 cargo was making it here per ship. So if you had at one time, it was they said it was uh, 10 ships out at the bay and it was a thousand per ship. That would have been seven thousand. And if you do the math, you know, only 40 to 60 percent. So let's say 50 percent, 3,500 of them would be making it here. So if you compare that with the African slave trade, and you said that many came out of there, and you put the math to it, it just won't add up. That's one of the topics that we always talk about and getting brothers and sisters understanding that most of us was already here. Already Islam. here, so get that clear. Islam, you want to say something to that? No, no, I was just saying that oh, okay. um, Islam, Islam. <laughs> Keep okay. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're hitting on some of the things that, um, thank you, that I had written down, written down, excuse me, when I, I, I put a note like transportation, and you just busted that up and explained that very well. Yeah. It's, um, oh, absolutely. You. And you also oh. see, when we also talk about for the, for the record, to put on the record in this here dude in his book, putting confirmation, what was the language that was spoken? When they also talk in there uh, about the uh, uh, the uh, uh, oh. Latin schools. Yes, I saw that too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, because we know that was the major language that was being spoken then. Mm-hmm. You know? And so he... he, he when you dissect this here dude in this book, and, and he makes a lot of confirmation on a lot of things that you be teaching at RB Bay and through the years uh, um, in different schools of thoughts, they be teaching by word of mouth and things and lectures to people. But when you read in the book and you dissect it, it he's giving confirmation from his research of the facts here um, to that yeah. point. Yeah. And also... Right. In here where they talk about it was 15,000 um, brought out of Ireland from 1718 to 1775. Also, that's just Ireland. You got to also look at the geography, the terror, look at the uh, continent in the map, the map there. That included England, Welsh, Scotland, uh, um, mm-hmm. you know, that whole area there, not just the Irish. All right, so if you times that by five or six, you know, uh, uh, what you got? You got a, uh, man, I am so fast doing the math here. You know, 100,000 or so, and, and just many more when he's putting it on the record there of these Europeans. And we already did um, the Barbados, and we know that they, the ones that went to Barbados and stuff like that. And, uh, Irish. Um, Irish. Yeah. A lot of Irish. Mm-hmm. A lot of Irish that went there. And like the movie, um, the one in New York, the, the yeah. Irish fighting back and stuff like that. So we, we, we see that whole thing here. Yeah. Uh, two the more things I want to. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Two, two more things I, I want to um, put in here when. When Ben Franklin, when they started talking about Ben Franklin and George Washington, and you understand who they were, you know, like Thomas Jefferson and all these dudes that was caught up in slaves themselves, you know, um, when he started talking about them in the time period in which he started talking about them, um, Understand, again, this, the, the Revolutionary War was going on at this here same time. And so these guys, during that period of time, of these runaways and stuff, all of them wasn't running away, getting back to England. You know, uh, they, they, they was running away, coming together, and trying to formulate a, a government for themselves so that they can protect themselves. You know, and, and and so 
you know, for those who start studying, use this book as a key, you know, and use some of his uh, um, resources, too, where he got his information from, because I, I did purchase a couple of those books. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and read where he got those research, his, uh, 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 where he did his research, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, you knew that those were um, um, ones that was uh, big in bringing about the independence and fighting the war. Uh, um, and so they only got involved in that time period of doing that war. So I just want to leave that. That's what I got from that and, um, well, you know, the perspective that I was trying to charge up, and then I yield the floor. Interesting, well, if I well. mean, because I know, I, I think that um, Anthony Schenkel was trying to answer a question, and I have another caller that I'm going to add in. But before I do, I want um, Anthony to um, answer his question. And prior to that, though, um, it's interesting what you're saying because, you know, they're talking about 1772, 1774, 1775, and, you know, leading up to 1776, right? Okay, so in 1774, they actually went to Philadelphia to the existing Congress. And that's the Articles of Association of 1774. They went there to ask the existing Continental Congress to assist them in being free from that. See, so, so this yes. is leading you right mm-hmm. up to what you're saying. Now you've got to know, read the 1774 um, Articles of Association, which is on the Forgotten Scroll page of um, RBJ Publications, and you'll see that they were asking for the assistance. And then, you know, that led up to 1776. So you're absolutely correct in what you're saying. Uh, this is the history. Remember, we're told that if you really want to know your history more, you've got to know the European history. Got to because yes. it's part of your history as well. And this is proof positive to that. And then um, that leads to the um, John Adams analysis letter. Uh, I'm sorry, the analysis of John Adams' letter, you know, after they did get their freedom. So, you know, we'll get to that future, uh, um, you know, coming um, where we can bring it right to and, and one other thing you mentioned, if you watch, look at, it's a six-week series that was on television called, um, oh, God, um, uh, yeah, something with the Negro. I can't even remember. I, this is sad that I don't remember the name of it. Oh, man. And in it, Miss however, education. no, not, not the miseducation. This is actually a TV series, and, um, it, it was only on for six weeks. It was a six-week series. You could probably pull it up if I could tell you what it's called, and I can't believe that I can't remember it. I'll try to get it before we hang up. But anyway, it was Negro, called, um, um, yeah, something the Negro. Yeah, yeah. And and they had the sister. Now check this 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 point of what point of what you just made of them as during the revolution where they had a sister who was captured off of the uh, African coast, she was enslaved. On the, uh, she was on the American land. And then they had the same slaves in it, in it. They say, they admit that they were slaves, indentured slaves. And then in one portion, while they were fighting on that war where the British gave up, they were fighting, um, and, and a European ran up to the sister. And she said to the sister, he said to the sister, are you a Tawny Moor? And she said, no. Uh huh. And then he says, well, all right then, because we're going to end slavery for good now. This is a model, you, we're not going to be enslaved anymore. Talk about himself. This was a absolute proof to the people who watched this that this, that they were the ones who were slaves, but they wanted to make sure what side she was on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and asked her, yes, yeah, yes, I'm going to get the name of that, but it was a six-week series, and it's the Negro something. Oh, I used to remember it. But that, just that part right there, when they wow. looked at her, couldn't tell whether she was the British Moor or, or the Al Moroccan Moor or, or a native of the land. You know what I mean? Uh, but had to ask her, 
that. And when she said no, they were like, okay, all right, because they knew they were fighting against the British to be free. So it was a very, very powerful proof point in that um, mm-hmm. that particular uh, movie. Um, now let me just add on. I think was it Anthony? Were you trying to ask a question? You said you had one more question, or was that you, Bakari? Uh, no, I just had I, a. I, think I'm good. Uh, uh, I just wrote a few things. Um, that's all. Oh, all right. Well, let me just add in another caller has been here, now, um, and that's eight oh eight two 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 three. You're live on the air. Is what I'm saying. Are you joining this in? Is in the are you joining in? Are you joining in, in to the discussion? Eight zero eight two two three. Yes, I am. All right. Hello, you can you hear me? Say who you are. We can hear you. It's on. Um, it's on. But this last chapter we read, it was uh, one point that I I got from this uh, that I want to touch upon. Uh, we covered it said that uh, the scores of people that have been destroyed here by the jail fever first communicated by servants on board of crowded infected ships. Uh-huh. Kind of saw that statement as potentially a uh, motivation for the planters to stop or fight for independence as opposed mm-hmm. to just the, the typical racial aspect, the white indentured servants look like us, and they have a, a, a the same plight even after they get out, uh, meaning that if they even went back, they were still treated as second-class citizens. So mm-hmm. if you had your operation set up here, and infectious people were coming in, mm-hmm. and you didn't take the time to weed out the infected, that mm-hmm. infection can spread and the all that you had built. Because mm-hmm. it really wasn't going to discriminate, but uh, we know who was more susceptible to it because who affected it more, right? The white cargo, mm-hmm. the 45 to 60% of uh cargo dying in transportation alone. So each one of those ships coming in were basically like a biological weapon. (laughs) Right, and guess what? They were second class citizens, you know, quote unquote, before they even came. You you know what I'm saying? (laughs) They were that. Right, right. But what was happening, but see, here's what it was. That's why you read that, and that's why Ben Franklin got his hair went back up on uh, on his neck because they were sending their quote unquote just another proof positive quote unquote their mother country right was sending these people mm-hmm. to he said it, to the colonies and plantations you know purposely because all of them yeah. there were second class citizens there and the plantations and the colonies that were set up here they were still second class citizens but yes yeah, it 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 it, it, it infectious. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think they turned and, that and, point home even more for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. And, and let me say this. Yeah. Go ahead, man. I, I, I wanted to say. Yeah, let me just say this, and and, and then just one second. You're right. It does bring it home for you because you've heard people say it, but now we're doing this circle of readers and uh, suggesting them books to really see the documentation on it. And in addition to that, when we physically went to Ellis Island, all right, because Ellis Island was the the lineal descendants of these slaves that were here. The Ellis Island people were the ones who were the lineal descendants that were free. They were made free by the Declaration of Independence. So their grandmothers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles and what have you were here, modern Europeans. They were here as slaves, but their descendants came with just this shirt on their back to what they call the new land, the free land, et cetera, like that. And in that, yes. at Ellis <laughs> Island, it tells you, it tells you that it, it tells you that they came and they bought disease, and that that disease ultimately was a biological warfare because they didn't even intend to kill them, but by their presence, by their presence. With the disease, they 
a lot of people died. So I just wanted to say that's also documented there. So bringing it home, yes, that'll bring it home for you even more, <laughs> you know. And I, yeah. I, I probably I, I didn't mean to cut you. You wanted to uh, comment on that? Yeah. I, I yeah. just wanted to say, um, I wanted to, like, I, I kind of want to thank Don Jordan and Michael Walsh, the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, two individuals who, who wrote the uh, book. And um, I also want to thank Anna Eid for uh, the, you know, for uh, bringing this, you know, book to the forefront. And uh, so I also want to thank you, Mother, um, for the platform as well. And um, Mm -hmm. like when you just mentioned um, (sighs) Liberty Island, uh, you know, like before the Statue of Liberty arrived, on the east coast of North America and was unveiled I think it was October 28, 1886 before the Barbary Wars from 1801 to 1815 before the Declaration of Independence uh, in 1776 uh, before England was called Britain in the 15th or, or correct and after uh, England was called Britain. Now I'm jumping ahead. Uh, after England was called Britain in the 1500s, and after the fall well, of Granada, mm-hmm. hmm? Britain was called England because Britain was first, and then England is the indication of the bastardization of the Englishmen, because the Englishmen, if you look it up in Oxford Dictionary. They say that we are but a hybrid. So actually, it was Britain and then England. Ah, ah, correction, or, correction. Yeah, that's all right. That's why. That's why when they say that we got our independence from England, but then when you go read the actual documents, it says from Britain <laughs> because they are mm. Englishmen. But the Englishmen, the British Moors, are the British Moors, the British or British Moors is who they got their independence from, period, although they had middlemen and managers and stuff, as we see in this book, to transport those overflow of modern Europeans to the companies here that are still the same companies, to the companies here, which were called plantations, all right, and or uh, com- uh, called companies, plantations. And if you read... The 1774 Article of Association, it shows you that right in there because they they named them and they used the word plantation in some of them because the original people working on those plantations were not us but was them coming from Britain, from the British Moors or from Britain. So later they refer, and now they refer themselves to English or Englishmen. But like I said, now you connect the dots. You go back and you look at what Englishman is in the Oxford Dictionary and it says, well, we are but a yeah. hybrid. Because I they know that, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, God. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, uh, th- there was a time when uh, the modern Europeans, the so-called modern Europeans, were being used as slaves yeah. at North America slash Northwest of Mexico. And yeah. um, uh, uh, one of the things that I thought about that capitalism, commerce. And colonialism uh, 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 run by criminals equals slavery. <laughs> I just thought that that was kind of funny, the, the way those four C's came together. And then subsequently in the 1630s, roughly 80,000 people were uh, 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 transported from England uh, 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 to the east coast of northwest of Mexico and the Atlantis Islands. And, and and it goes to and, and, and furthermore, there were many types of people um, uh, uh, in different stations of uh, 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 life, you know, so-called different, you know, so, uh, uh, social status that that were part of that uh, uh, sin called slavery. Um, and so, uh, even the children were not excused. Um, yeah. In fact, <laughs> it, you know, at 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 at, at one point, uh, they were preferred, um, hence the term kidnapping. And so the reason why I, I, I mentioned the, 
the dates was along the same lines as Brother Asim to, to you know, to, to, to try to add some concept you know, for the listeners, because there's so much that goes that that goes on during this time frame, um, and 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 so on. So um, yeah, um, I thought that those that that those dates, uh, when uh, Mother Roz mentioned the the uh, uh, Liberty Island, I, I thought I'd throw that out there. Absolutely, it's two to five ways. This the book of Negroes. That's what we were trying to say. Oh, the book of, yeah, yeah, that's right. Of Negroes, that was it, Ross. The book of Negroes <laughs> was that six-week period. Thank thing. you. That's it. Yeah, he's that's right. right. Yeah. Book of Negroes. Yes, oh, yeah, that's I watched it. that as well. It was good. Ross, yeah. before I forget, I don't want to get off topic. Did you get a CD, a DVD that I sent you? Night I Jump? did. I think. Yes, it's right here. What? Um. What's the name of it? Uh, Night John. Night John. I got it right here. And I meant to tell you right. the last time we broadcast, I suppose this is something that um, you're suggesting because you sent your and your wife sent it as a guest that I look at. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Because it's going to um, talk about something in there. There's a, a couple. I'll wait till you look at it. But I just needed to oh, ask okay, you. Know that. Well, let me just say what it is for the listeners who might want to get it as well. I'll say what it, what it reads. It says it's called Night John, based on the novel by Gary Polson, and then it has underneath a subtitle, Words Are Freedom. All right? When we talk uh-huh. about jurisdiction, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Right words. words are freedom. Mm-hmm. All right. And... Uh-huh. And and the real star of the movie is a young girl, nine years old. Uh, so a mother. So I ain't gonna give no more than that. All right. Um, I do want to make another point. I don't want to digress, but and I really, I mean, the conversation is bringing me to this here to do this here because we do have one more chapter left to go into, and it will uh, uh, bring it up. But the show you did last night, and then this here, I wanted to. Well, um, well, not last night, but I do want to bring this up here for everyone to go and read the Nationalization Act of 1795. And what made me think of this here when the brother was talking about them coming over here diseased, not only was it going to kill uh, uh, us as the natives and stuff that was here, and wipe them out. It will wipe them out also because they had several attempts coming here in the early uh, um, or at the end of the fifteen uh, hundreds. Uh, they had several attempts that came when they came here, and they were unsuccessful. And uh, a, a lot of uh, those modern Europeans died. All right, and so. When Ben Franklin and um, got involved in that, I would only assume or presume that he understood that if they was coming and they was coming here, a lot of them would have perished also. And they needed many of them as they can because, understand, at that time, it was very vital during that same time we talked about it in early chapters. It was natives that didn't want them here. It was killing them if they left off of the cow, off of the uh, plantation. You That's know? right. And so they needed to keep their numbers up for sure. You know, at, at, at that time. So um, um, it was the thought when the brother uh, um, brought that up. You know, biological warfare because. On the other end, they just was about the money. You can be sick, what, whatever. They said, what, disease, crippled, whatever. You going on the ship, I'm getting paid, and when you get there, let them figure it out. You, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. what he was saying, basically. You know, mm-hmm. in that, diseased or whatever. I got paid already. It was a, a, a 
It was a ledger in already for for bodies. They took them on the ship. I'm paid. See you. And and if they would have kept bringing them, a lot of those colonies could have been um, wiped out because, like they said, over in England, it was it was it killed judges and and the whole court, you know, got diseased and then they was dying. And so, um, and he only talked about it, but you have to magnify that scale. So the brother made a real good point. I wanted to say that to him. That was a good point. Yeah. Wow. Another thing that I found really interesting too, um, well, you know, really sad, uh, you know, it kind of makes you feel for these people. Um, well, not kind of, it definitely makes you feel for the people, like regardless of what their descendants are doing to us today. Um, a lot of these people were innocent because, I mean, like these cats were getting caught up for just all kinds of stupid stuff. And then being transported over here. I mean, like literally, you could just snatch yeah. up a loaf of bread, and the next thing you know, because you're hungry, and the next thing you know, you're on a ship. You know, um, <laughs> so <coming>. you know. <laughs> you, I mean, that's just. I mean, I, I I really feel for some of these people, and and then there's even the 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 one case, um, Razumaya, when they talked about the. Uh, uh, I forget which chapter it was when the young man, his his own uncle, wanted to get that cheese, so he has cheated his inheritance, sent the boy packing to the, uh, uh, you know, to the East Coast, you know, you know, put him on the ship. That's yeah, right. that's right. yeah. But how do we I translate mean, so, that so, Yep, yep. How do we translate that today? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness! The yeah. municipality, yeah. Roman 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 That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. The same thing is happening in reverse. Right. I just want to read brother yeah. I just wanted to make one other point because um, a little earlier, uh, one of the brothers on the line were was speaking about the, the makeup and. Uh, in Europe, in England, and Ireland, Scotland. Um, a while back, I got curious just to see what Google would do, and I Googled the question of when did the Romans invade Britain? And we came back, uh, it's in Wikipedia, it's what basically Google reads out. In 55 BC, the Roman general Julius Caesar led his army across the seas from Gaul, which we know today is Germany and France, uh, to Britain. He wanted to make Britain part of Rome's empire. The British Celts uh, fought bravely, and Caesar soon went back to Gaul. Next year, in 54 BC, the Romans came back. And that was from Wikipedia about 51 weeks ago. I mentioned that because if we look at uh, ancient and modern Britons, volume one, David McRitchie published in 1884, page 187, he describes that the Celts then formed one division of pure whites, the Moors, or pigs, of the pure blacks, and both were living side by side in Britain when the Romans came. And the time period, 55 B.C. It's all. Wow. Islam, good work, brother. Good bill. Yeah, that was to point to the other brother they called in earlier. The, the first brother they called in. Yeah, brother. Mm. Yes. Islam, I also remember um, take up about people being taken for small stuff. There was someone that was an actual, um, what's they, what do they call him? But he was a beautician, or he did hair, or he had the skill of that set. Oh, and yeah. He wanted to look good or for the ladies or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. What was what was that about? What was that, what was going on with that part of it? I, I know it was something uh-huh. that was a short sentence. Um, yeah, they, they were comical. taking people. Yeah. Yeah. No. But I just I, I think that. I I think. 
that you're saying, what 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 were they saying that was so comical? Actually, uh, they were. Let me go back. Do you remember what page that was? Because I, I I saw that too, and they were making a joke out of it that you know he was with the women and that the American women or something like that like to dress she nicely or something. So. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I don't remember what yeah, that gonna, was, but I think that was the gist, I'm gonna that find the gist of it. He, yeah. You think what? I think I think that was the gist of it. He he wanted um he took something small and yeah. they ended up capturing him and um but he just wanted to look good for the women when he Here got it is. there or, or something to that effect. Here it is. Two five six, page two five six, he says it says there were brief moments of comedy in the convict deportations from Ireland. The Dublin Mercury for 9th of uh, June to 13th of June in 1767 ran the story about a transported felon. Um, and it says, among the unfortunate transport shipped out last Monday was one poor fellow who, being skilled in modern fashions of hairdressing, had unluckily made two free with some of his employer's trinkets. So that means he stole something, right? One mm-hmm. thing proposed to himself might be a useful introduction to his being employed by the ladies in America who will, like the ladies of their sister kingdom, not be outdone in their mode of fashion. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, yeah, right. So I'm not totally clear what's so funny about that. It's nothing funny about the fact that he was sent over to be a, a, a slave because he stole a trinket from the women, uh, from, because he did women's hair. Hair. Maybe he was a good hairdresser and they were going to get him anyway because the women in America like to look good. I still find nothing funny about it. So. Mm. But it, did, did it also say sister, like sister city or sister, like they were doing, Oh, they were used to doing and business sister, together in that sense. It says, it's a, okay, I got you. I saw that. It says kingdom. It says one thing you post to himself might be a useful introduction. To his being employed by the ladies in America who will like, who will like the ladies of their sister kingdom not be out of mm-hmm. In mode of fashion, excuse me. So there it is right now. There, because see, here's what's happening. Remember, they were over here already. And they were trying, as, 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 as he's saying, they were trying to uh, make a new life for you know, they came over here. Uh, all all that was concerned about, and I mentioned it in this book, and I think Asim mentioned it also, is that we don't care. Once we get you there, it's your problem how to deal with whatever. We don't really care about the condition or whatever. So they were going off to be, you know, to they eventually had to go off to get their own uh, government, quote, unquote, to be free from the British. So there were some who... Uh, so, so I don't know when they say ladies of their sister kingdom, whether they are talking about the Moors, you know, because our Moroccan Moors did not participate in, at this time anyway, they weren't the ones who were really participating so much in the slavery thing. The, mm. the, the Moors here were the aboriginals who really didn't want these modern European to be here, like, like, like we've read. If they stepped off of the plantation and wanted to travel, one, because they brought disease, all right? Even though they still, these modern Europeans wanted a better life, they probably felt they deserved a better life, all that lives wants to live, et cetera, like that. So you got to deal with the time period. This time period is 1767. So now that's, that's a little later on. But so the, 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 the Alma Rocker Moore system didn't have nothing to do with this. However, it was allowed for our cousins, the British Moors, if you will. Um, I mean, our cousins, if you will, because that's really how we have to look at it, which is why they say 
The Moorish Empire, the sun never set on the Moorish Empire because it's on both sides. So they had mm. an agreement to come here to set up, now listen, to set up companies, to set up companies. Remember earlier in this book, they had been duped, some of them, at earlier, early on, into thinking they were what? Coming to a new world to have a job and work. But they were really roping them into to be enslaved and work on plantations. So it's not like they became slaves, though. They are Slavic. They are the original slaves, all right? So they were always second-class citizens from that uh, respect, which is why they treated them so badly, the British, the British lords. So now they set up companies, though, and they had them think they're coming over here to work in companies when they really were coming over here to be terribly, terribly, continually, terribly mistreated. And when I say continually, because they were actually mistreated when they were in Britain. But so they're thinking they're coming to a new world with a new life, et cetera, like that. And they were coming to work on plantations. Then that became an extreme commodity, an extreme business, and grew. And that's why Prophet Numa Jirali reminds us, he says, listen, every, everyone suffered slavery. Every nation has suffered slavery. So it became a commodity, and it didn't really have a skin tone. Called, you know, it wasn't like white or black. That white or black thing wasn't even in the mix right then. It mm. was just about human trafficking. So mm. uh, when they came, now remember, they started, set, this is what they do now, setting up ranks. You know, like, I don't know what they call them, them, but the captains of the ship or whatever. Their only duty was management. Their management was to see how many slaves they could get over to sell. And then they did that underhanded thing, as as we're saying, and sent them over here. We don't know. 20 of them got on the ship. Yeah, we, you know, that's what we got paid for or whatever like that. When they really may have sold them and got more or, or counted that they delivered 20 when it was only 15 or whatever it may be. So it became a business and a commodity. So it, it, this, this book is showing, this history is showing how, you know, it gets up to that point. But what we need to un- know and never lose sight of is that these people came, even though, you know, they are, are, are the British, our cousins bought them here to work in companies, those companies in the Union States today, quite frankly. So they came mm-hmm. to work in companies. Yes, and we need to be clear about that. That's right. Matter of fact, mm-hmm. matter of fact, when they talk about the bulges in, in there, and you go mm-hmm. to the Virginia House of Bulges, that was the legislation that they set up. But who set it up? The Virginia Company. Yep. <laughs> so when you look <laughs> that up, so to your point, when you look up the bulges, the the burges, when they're talking about the, you, that's another key for you to research. And you see that that was the Virginia legislations that the um, um, Virginia company set up, you know, to yeah. do their bidding. And you're starting to see that today here. Oh, absolutely. But where they moving, these people, uh, um, you can say KKK, they moving them into different positions to rule these um, circuit and district courts and stuff, putting judges into those courts and stuff so that if you do try to bring a case to a district court or um, one of these circuit courts, then they, they have their judges in place. So uh, I, that's another story to go into, but that, that's what's going on here. Wow. This my yield the yep. Yes, well, if there's any last comments from anybody, because believe it or not, it's 1024. We're going to be going off to air in six minutes uh, total. And, um, you know, it's always been, well, I made it through, even though I have a cold. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, enjoy, I always enjoy it when I, when I um, have to really sit in on these. I enjoy speaking with everyone who's calling. I enjoy um, your input. Um, uh, I've already reading ahead of time, Mr. Mimbakari. I do know that much uh, with the two of you. Thank you for that. And I know Anna E appreciates that as well. We all do, and all the listeners. You know, it's a great time to just sit back and have a book read to yourself. It's all good. But she did say, uh, now we do have one more chapter of this. And guess what? There's five Wednesdays in this month, so we're going to.
going to be back here on Wednesday to complete, um, right? Because this is the last Wednesday of this month, correct? Yes. So we'll be here um, Wednesday for the Circles of Readers next Wednesday. The next time you're going to hear from us, of course, is Tuesday. Um, I don't know what the Sons of Allah is. Or, uh, they already had theirs. Yes, they did, I think, for this month. So uh, I just want to remind people, too, that um, – Send that email. We're having the sisters, the first national sisters, uh, sisters sitting on the wall conference. And that's going to, uh, we, we're gathering information for it, but you send an email to mhhiswideopen at gmail.com. If you're interested, sisters, in uh, attending NANA, we're looking to have it um, in the spring. We don't have the dates or anything set. We're just trying to gather up enough information. I keep forgetting to mention that on the show on the uh, pre- last few broadcasts. And um, we're going to be back here on Tuesday for our National Principal Action at 9.30. And then this circle of readers will be next Wednesday at 7.30. I appreciate all of your input. I thank all of you for um, listening. And I definitely thank you to callers who called in and uh, joined in in this uh, discussion. Uh, anything that you want to add or any of you who are on the line here helping out with this discussion, is any last thing you want to say? There's no, one I want to say peace to everyone on the line, and I also want to give a, give a big shout-out to Najib Al. If it wasn't for that, brother, yeah. a lot of uh, uh, great broadcasts, uh, unfortunately, I would have missed recently being ill. You so, said you want to so give on. a shout-out to Thank who? Oh, to Eddie E. All right, Eddie E. Eddie E. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's fine. Yes. Yeah, Islam. Is, Islam, diddle that as well. Diddle that as well. For All right. Annie E. to L. All right. All right. Is it good to hear you? Yeah, this is um, me also. And to you, Mother Rise, to you, Mother Rise, who's fighting through it. <laughs> fighting through it. I mean, this is. Um, just a trooper, mother, mother, sister, soldier, <laughs> mother, <laughs> yeah. sister, soldier. You know, do your thing, sis. <laughs> I love you. Yeah, a few times when I said hold on to me, I had to take a sip of tea. I didn't want to. I got a loud thing in the background. What is that? Uh-oh. What is that? No I think that's me. Uh oh, I think that's me. Oh, all right. Well, uh, again, I thought I was going to hold on a minute. It's just because I didn't want to call for food and anybody here. And I had to take a sip of my ginger tea that says you made for me. So, and Echinacea tea. But, uh, hey, we do what we have to do. We soldier on. I'm glad that um, I was a part of this this evening. I'm glad I'm a part of this for, for all the time and forevermore. So thank you all for joining. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday at 9.30 and next Wednesday do the last chapter of White Cargo. Peace and love. Thank you all. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. No more back to thinking. Time for thinking.